Four years passed, and I was in grade 11. Grade 7 was long years behind me, and I scarcely noticed Lysandra as she came and went. Besides, my whole consciousness was absorbed by my feelings for Brett Houston. He had arrived fresh from the city of Toronto on the first day of school that year, and I had spent 24 weeks wanting him. As the year progressed, he had moved from pretty girl to pretty girl, in and out of our class, and I took courage from this fact. An early solid attachment, for instance, to the beauteous Sally Cornwall of grade 10 would have spelled permanence and hopelessness for me. But obviously, he was still searching. Any minute, it might be my turn. And suddenly, miraculously, it was. Coming up behind me one day as I pulled books from my locker, he grabbed my arm and swung me around to face him. Hi, cute stuff, he said in his wonderful flat Toronto voice. I looked at his size, his blonde good looks, his casual grin, and my chest was alive with thundering heartbeats, tight with constricted breathing. Tonight, he said, moving his gum over to the other side of his mouth. The movies, at eight. Time for a little ride first. Okay, I said, my hands shaking as they once again reached for my books, my eyes only marginally in focus. I'll walk you home, he said, slamming my locker door with a masterful bang. Holy Toledo, I thought. As the weeks went by, as March moved into April and then into May, I marveled that this beautiful person was in my possession. Gone were the months of moving from girl to girl. We were going steady. It had lasted seven whole weeks. I waited on him, packed picnic lunches, wrote essays for him, massaged his shoulders after baseball practice, watched sports programs on TV all Saturday afternoon, mended his socks, walked his dog. Even I could see that I looked different, my skin aglow, my eyes eager, my smile at the ready. I adored him. I watched his coming and his going with undisguised worship. I had a part-time job at a local variety store, and on the night of the spring dance I had to work the evening shift. I told Brett I'd meet him at the school after the store closed at 9 o'clock. He had to get there early to attach the balloons to the ceiling. When I entered the darkened gymnasium by the side door, I almost bumped into him. Him and Lysandra. They were facing one another, standing sideways to me. She had cut her hair in low bangs, and the rest of it hung almost to her waist, black as night. She had on large hoop earrings and a low-cut black peasant blouse. There was a lot of chest to see, and her chest was a good one. That's all I remember about what she was wearing. I was too busy taking note of the way she was running a slender finger up and down his forearm, saying, Come on, Brett, let's just dance a little bit while you're waiting. No point in just standing around. She won't mind. As they came together to dance a slow number, I watched that same finger move slowly up his spine and then come to rest on the back of his neck. She lifted her lovely face to his, enormous eyes mocking, ready. As she and Brett moved off into the darkness, they looked like one person. They were dancing that close. He came back and collected me. I'll say that for him. That evening we danced like mechanical dolls, arms and legs moving, but no life in us or between us. I could see Lysandra over by the springboards and the parallel bars watching us, smiling, Brett waited until the next day to abandon me, without a word of explanation or farewell. I thought I would die of heartbreak, or wished I could, but of course I did nothing of the sort. Brett followed Lysandra around like a panting puppy all spring, servile, pliant, and sent her an orchid for the graduation formal. I went to that dance with Horace McNabb, who danced like a tractor, lumbering around, squashing my feet. I laughed loudly and frequently, tossing my hair over my shoulders. Brett and Lysandra glided around the gym with their eyes closed, slow dancing to everything, their bodies pressed hard together. The day after the formal, Lysandra told Brett she was tired of him and gave him back his baseball crest. Then she could be seen once again in the town library, reading, reading, and writing page after page of poetry. She had lost her stunned, vapid look. She moved once more with measured coordination, with grace. She even spoke to me from time to time, a neutral, unadorned hello in passing. Brett moved away with his family in the fall of that year. His father said he couldn't hack the climate. He said he wanted to live someplace where he could depend on owning a dry pair of shoes. 
I met Brett 20 years later at a high school reunion. He was 38 years old, balding, stout, boring, a petulant wife in tow. Lysandra did not attend the reunion. By now I've read a lot of Lysandra's poetry. It appears in academic journals and the better popular magazines. She has published seven volumes and has won two national awards. She often turns up on the literary pages of newspapers, and I'm as likely to see her name in the Globe and Mail as in the Halifax Mail Star. The CBC loves to interview her. I don't understand many of her poems. They seem to be speaking a language that I never learned, and are plugged into a source of power that is a puzzle to me. But I can tell you this. Her poetry contains such bitterness that the mind reels as it reads, dizzy from such savage images, such black revelations. The words claw out from the pages like so many birds of prey, and all of them seem to be moving in my direction.